How We're is live. It? Wow. Okay. Welcome in theory, in spirit, if not in practice or vice versa, to Bourbon and Bitches. What was supposed to be episode 15-ish, um, Tiffany Madison witnessed a uh, drunk driving car accident, so she gets to talk to the Popos right now, which is not a lot of fun for her, I imagine. Um, Meg, who we love deeply, is still hard at work on all of her um, startup majesty. And a couple of my, I don't even know who my guests were supposed to be. One of them never appeared. Uh, one of them is Jesse, who may or may not be able to hear us right now. Um, but at least we can, hey, there he is. And we also have Mike Reed of Liberty.me, who I drafted into this podcast. And he <laughs> accepted his fate willingly. Um, <gasps> Boys, introduce yourself if you would, and if you're drinking anything, I have this delightful hard cider. So. Oh, that's good. Mike, let you go first. Okay, great. Uh, hi, I'm I'm Mike Reed. I'm uh, the Liberty Dot Me impresario, which means I'm responsible for all this crazy stuff that happens on Liberty Dot Me Live. So it's a delight to get uh, drafted in quite accidentally to to, to Bourbon and Fine Ladies. I, I was actually about to go to sleep. I was in my bed, and I just thought, maybe I should check my email one last time. And there's, like, panicked emails from Tiffany, like, I'm in a car accident, and my house is on fire, there's aliens. And uh, so here I am. <laughs> well, yep, that's why he's here, folks. Uh, Jesse, tell the people who you are. Um, I'm Jesse. I live in New Orleans. I... Um... I'm a U.S. Army veteran. Got a uh, pretty pretty involved in the Bitcoin scene. Um, pretty much everything. Pretty much everything Liberty related. I'm I got a, a hand in it somewhere. So almost like you're Jesse, a secret you used... ruler of the world. Yeah. No. Jesse, you no, used no. to have a ton of Bitcoin mining equipment. Is that right? Did you have like one of those like secret chambers full of I don't know what it is. Modems that, that do that? No, no. I had I had a bunch of specialized uh, ASIC miners that um, I had in my old apartment before I moved here, and uh, it was it was pretty perilous. I probably almost set the place on fire a few times. But uh... <laughs> okay, let me ask you this about Bitcoin. This this is something I just I, I don't that? understand. Like. Go ahead. If there's going to be some kind of arbitrary activity that you have to take part in in order to produce new Bitcoins, why couldn't it be something nice like feeding homeless people or, I don't know, building shelters for cats? Like, how come it has to be just like putting computers in a closet and making your house catch on fire? Uh, you know, it's mining has become a very challenging thing. Um, well, home mining has been a very challenging thing because you had, you had a lot of people who made a lot of money in the beginning. And, um, you know, went out and had Schneider build custom data centers that they filled with these specialized miners. Um, so, I mean, it's become, I'm not going to say totally impractical, but pretty impractical for home miners to really make any money. I mean, you're not going to get rich, you know, in your apartment with some ASIC miners. But um, it's a fun okay. hobby, and it's a good way to get some some untraceable bitcoin i guess if you're if you're really worried about like, uh, like, bank account transactions this is a way to get around that so but they could probably um, look at your bill and, and this is not <laughs> bourbon and bitcoin however mike play be play, be cowed i am the queen of the hour so simmer down and i shall take control of things <laughs> i've had it um in theory, we were going to discuss the horrors of the election that is to befall us next year. Um, one of our lovely five viewers can ask any questions they like, and we can answer them. Um, I believe at some point we had a question of whether we wanted a rich, oh, sorry, a country club spoiled kid like Rand Paul for president. Hmm. You know, I are there I've been really on the fence about 
about this whole Ron Paul uh, Rand Paul thing. I um, you know, I got really disenfranchised in politics a long time ago. Even when I was in the army, and I was a a diehard Republican for a long time, which is how I was raised. I um, I just always had a feeling that there was nothing to it. Like there is nothing for us in the uh, in the election process. Um, and I'll admit it. I got I got pulled into the hype here with uh, with Rand Paul. I I originally got into libertarianism pretty hardcore and. You know, I was elected secretary of the local libertarian chapter here, um, which I held that position for a few months before I, I left because the group was pretty inactive. They were just looking to grow numbers and make money and not that much else. Um, but what it also turned out to be, the group was a bunch of disenfranchised Republicans that moved to liber the Libertarian Party after Ron Paul got kicked in the teeth. So they weren't really like valuable libertarians because they were bitter and they were Republicans. I mean, they're really what they were. Um, Rand Paul speaks a really good game. I mean, he had a lot of balls going up there and, and saying what he said. I mean, he called out the machine straight up. You know, there was no mincing words. Um, You know, I don't know. I I don't, I know a lot of libertarians are really looking for somebody to like go in there guns blazing and saying, you know, you're all fired. We're just going to start over. But it, it can't work like that. If it's going to work at all, it can't work like that. Because so my they're burn down the DEA platform is not going to get me elected is what you're saying. Right. I mean... It's I certainly not going to make out, out first. Like I, I'm nice. I I just want to ceremonially ceremonially burn the building down. Um, hey, I mean you're on a watch list he, now, so you're welcome. He's been there for five years, um, or so. He's he knows what he's getting into, and I and a lot of the other uh, candidates can't say that. I don't think this is a situation. I do think. This is a very important time. If anybody good was going to come in, this is the time for it to happen. Why? But it needs to be somebody who knows what they're doing. We don't have time as the American people for a learning curve. And why is this the time for, for this to happen? I, I mean, I'm curious I don't think why we can survive another four I don't know that we can survive another eighteen months of what we're going through right now. I mean in what way? Be specific here. Well, I mean, from a financial perspective, you've got you've got the Fed and and everybody just kind of making up money and just kind of kicking the can along until the inevitable happens. I mean, they're literally going week by week in in most cases, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, they know what the time is. They know that. I mean. <laughs> When the people that are making up money out of nothing are going on a week by week basis, something is about to happen. I mean, when the Fed starts short timing it, you better start looking. Um, I mean, do you, you know, think we've, I've heard ahead. like the, the system, the system as it stands now compared possibly, well, I forget to say this, but, um, it's like a runaway car. It's a, well, it's a car with no brakes, so you can't stop it, but you might be able to steer it out of the path of those children or those trees or something. And I feel like that kind of makes sense. I mean, the, both the optimists and the pessimists think that like a president can do more than he actually can or she. Let's not be sexist here. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how much hope anybody should put in a presidential election at least our type of people because they're going to do too much and too little just like any other president it kind of seems like well there's two things that are different about Rand Paul kind of his his father brought up a lot of really good 
you know, points, a lot of things that people needed to hear. And because of that, they completely wiped him off the TV. You know, he went in, he went all in, no apologies, said exactly how he felt, and he got erased off the coverage for it. Rand Paul has sat there for five years. He's acquiesced on some things that he needed to, but he still stood up in Congress for 13 hours, you know, doing his little um, uh, filibuster deal. I mean, so he's got the cojones, you know, and he, I mean, yeah, he, he seems to have, you know, his heart in the right place or whatever. Um, and he certainly has a lot of support. But my th my whole thing is, even if he gets in, he's probably just going to get shot anyway. If you know, if he indeed becomes the person that he s seems to want to be, the machine will take care of it, just like they've taken care of everybody else. You either if roll everybody into else the machine. Too. Well, I mean. I don't know, Martin Luther King, JFK, Reagan, take don't, a pick. Don't, don't do that. Don't martyr JFK. He was a statist asshole just like the rest of them. The best thing that well, ever happened <laughs> to JFK was getting shot in the head so that he could be preserved as one of the sanctified Kennedys. I mean, he started the Vietnam War. He almost blew up the world in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I've never found the idea that he was about to do something good or knew something or wouldn't be someone's puppet and then he was killed to be at all compelling. And I think it's totally possible that the CIA or Cuba or anti-commies or commies could have had something to do with the assassination, but I don't think that that, um, we shouldn't use that to say that JFK was somebody like some heroic figure by any means. Oh, no, 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 no. I would never, I would never give him that crown, but... Um, I mean, the people we're dealing with in Washington are very violent people. You don't have to go to JFK or, or anybody else to, to see that. I mean, you can look at their policies. You know, you can look at the fact that in passing Obamacare, they hired tens of thousands of armed IRS agents to, to, to you know, enforce it. That, you know, we're allegedly this bastion of freedom and i guess this goes into you know the tax stuff yet we have unqualified people with guns running around enforcing 74,000 pages of tax law and a health care bill i mean um, i don't remember what the number is for um federal agencies that have armed um people i don't know if it's like 30 something it's a list of, it's not, you know, not the usual suspects, the FBI, the CIA, all those horrible people that we assume are armed. Park it is Rangers. indeed people like IRS. Um, Park Rangers. Wildlife. That lost, that, yeah, the wildlife in D.C. lost how many AR-15 rifles last year or, or a couple years ago? I mean, they're like, you know, no no citizens can have guns, but yet everybody that works for the government has to have you know, the most militant weapons on the planet. I feel like we're dancing into a lot more fun of a topic than elections, which is conspiracy theories. <laughs> we can always follow that path down. We need to do the hat thing again. Oh, man. I didn't prepare. My tin foil's in the <laughs> kitchen. Right. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> that... No, that Tim will not protect you from the there. aliens or the government. <laughs> but I repeat myself. Right. Just kidding. <laughs> the uh, government is not made of aliens, as far as I know. Um, yeah, we're, here we are, two roads. Continue talking about elections or just talk about conspiracy theories, like how I totally reread John Ronson's Them, Adventures with Extremists, which is a really good book, um, things like that. But, uh, I don't know. Mike, it's your show. you gotta... Is it? Is it, though? Mike, Mike, Mike you're muted. I can't hear you. 
I haven't read them, but I've been wanting to read them for a long Dude, time. Dude, read it. Uh, it's so good. And, like, there's a companion documentary series that's on YouTube. You can just find um, find the things. The, the Not Satanist Wants Conspiracy Theories. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, see, okay. I'm the... Uh, what about them, though? I'm, I'm by um, nature the, the boring type that I think conspiracy theories are interesting, and presumably there's a lot of... Uh, you know, uh, sneaky people doing sneaky things all the time. Um, but in general, they're not actually as important as uh, the ideas held by the vast majority of the of the population. Like it's you know it, it's not it's not as important as whether people uh, believe I don't know they need the FDA to protect them. Um, so so you know I'm I'm a you know conspiracy theories are fascinating, interesting. I read I read my share of books. I put a link in. So a book um, I was involved in producing, The Kennedy Autopsy, which I will now link again uh, because we're actually offering it uh, free for the next two weeks or so on uh, Liberty.me. So you should go and get your EPUB copy. It's by Jacob Hornberger of the Future Freedom Foundation. And it's oh, all about uh, yeah. uh, it's a it's a really fascinating book. OK, so I was about to say that I think conspiracy theories are not as important as the underlying ideas of the population. But then this is a really fascinating book because it just zooms in on the weird stuff that happens with Kennedy's body from the time that he dies yeah, to yeah, like, it's yeah. kind of like a day later. There, it, there. The, okay. Go, Go ahead, ahead, Jesse. No, no. Uh, the body is delivered to the morgue twice in two different caskets. Okay. Like, what is going on there? I've read just, like, there's no explanation. A couple of them, but I... Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's questions, and this is the thing about like, any conspiracy theory, any good conspiracy theory, is that it may be completely full of shit, but it does bring up questions that are very valid. <laughs> and and it's like, you know, you can't. There's a thing like like as a as a security like a, as a computer security person. There's there's things that work or should work, and then there's things that shouldn't work but might. And when you're trying to probe somebody's network, you do the things that should work, you know, because they're not commonly known exploits or things like that. And then once you get through all those, you go through the bag of things that they should be smart enough to block. And quite frankly, more often than not, that's the bag that you, you can pull from because nobody secures their stuff properly. But, um, <laughs> yeah, me but I mean... You can look at these things and, and, and on the face of it, like with 9-11, you can say, you know, well, we have all this intelligence and all these systems and all this technology. You know, there's no way that, you know, these Islamists and mountains could figure out a way to infiltrate the American, uh, you know, aviation schools and, and do all this stuff. But, you know, a lot of them were were you know, high level educated people. In fact, statistically speaking, most Islamic terrorists are very educated people. These are not desperate, um, you know, crazed people. Um, they tend to know exactly like, what I they're got, doing. Right. They know exactly what they're doing and they think they're getting 72 virgins or maybe they don't. I don't know. But they, they are very cognizant of what they're doing. And and but the thing about 9/11 and the thing about any of these conspiracy theories for me because I obsessed on all of them, you know. I was a big into Area 51 when I was a kid, and yeah. you know all that. And um, you know I read every book on aliens. I know all about the Greys and the little people and all these other things and moon bases and all that. And um, but then, you know, and then I got really big into 9-11 after I got out of the Army and started learning a lot about 9-11 truth, which which we were extremely insulated from that stuff, as you can imagine, in the military. We knew nothing about that. Even when we were back, we didn't hear anything about it. But once I got out and I started talking to people, you know, it was balls to the wall. And I ate up every video. I was, you know everything I could get my hands on. So, but then I started to realize after Obama was elected that there's so much more relevant shit going on 
that's real, that I could at any given moment turn on any main main news station and say, that's a fucking problem right there, and there's no conspiracy necessary. You know, like. Oh yeah. You know. That's an, that's it's a, There's no conspiracy necessary is a great like takeaway. Not that I'm not interested in this, and that not that some of it's true and some of it could be true, but. It can be a distraction from how how the banality of evil, as as they say, and the fact that a lot of the government people who do bad things, I think a lot of them te- like they tell themselves they do good every day. Yeah. Or they frown concernedly about who they're bombing, and they feel a little bad about it, but not bad enough to not do it. No, no, they feel yeah. bad enough to invent drones to completely separate themselves from it. So that they don't yeah. have to have compassion yeah. about it because machines are doing it. And if anybody gets killed that is innocent, sorry, dude. You're a casualty of innovation. But, um, Indeed. I mean, you know, when I was over there, we had some drones, but they were only in the capacity of surveillance. They weren't armed. You know, they were very primitive and huge compared to what they look like now. Um, and, uh, but, I mean... You know, we knew the difference of things. There's things that, you know, they, they always said, you know, you'd never, no matter how much technology improved, you could never replace the human infantry, which is what I was. And, you know, we would sit there and you would hear weddings in the next village over and they would shoot rifles off and we wouldn't know what the hell was going on. So we'd send our translator down there to go figure out what was going on. And he'd come, oh, yeah, they're getting married. They're having a good time. <laughs> if a drone saw that, those people are dead. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. And that happens every day. You know, they flew planes in our buildings one day for three hours, two hours. We have assaulted their countries every day since. That's the reality. Well, uh, and before. And, and before. But, and... And, and and talk about conspiracy theories, you know, I have news articles days before or months before in the summer of 2001 where the Bush administration was begging our nation um, allies to go into Afghanistan, begging to go there for reasons we still don't know why. But there's news articles where they were begging these other countries to basically give them the international okay to go into Afghanistan. And then 9-11 happened, and it didn't matter. What the hell is that all about? You know? Um, yeah. I mean, the trillion dollars that was lost from the Pentagon that was announced on September 10th. Whatever happened to that? Mm-hmm. You know? It's entirely possible that there's something like to 9-11 conspiracy theories that is like that. It's about money, or it's about... I mean, we know that the U.S. government could have, you know, picked up the damn memo and said, gee, uh, bin Laden determined to strike, you know, inside U.S. What could this mean? And instead of putting it, you know, in the other pile, they could have been like, maybe we should get on this. Here's um, a book. <laughs> Here's a book that I, I really I mean, recommend. I up- oh, go ahead. Sorry. I have looked up, you know, the most ridiculous theories. And... You know, it, like there wasn't hologram planes, you know, yeah, and like all the other really. Abs- that's my favorite. The sea. <laughs> my favorite is that the towers never existed at all. Everybody uh, was like <laughs> hypnotized, like Men in Black. It was like. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's my favorite one because that is the most happened. likely. <laughs> so, so this book here, this is um, Bad News by Tom Fenton who was the uh, foreign, senior foreign correspondent for CBS before he retired because he was tired of the bullshit. Um, before 9-11, every major news network had foreign correspondents, American foreign correspondents that were all over the world waiting for something to happen, and they would report back mm-hmm. when it happened. Nowadays, everybody just gets their news from, from BBC or an international Reuters or whatever. And it, um, you know, they just slap their their logo on it and call it theirs. Right. But before we had journalists all over the world, 
he was in Afghanistan in 96 and had an interview lined up with Osama bin Laden. The, the, the uh, mm -hmm. agency denied it, saying there was too much Arabic in it, and he wanted like $25,000 or something for the interview. But they said, no, there's too much Arabic in it. American people won't be interested. So it never got – so in 96, they knew something was going on with this guy. Uh, yeah. And they just didn't want to deal with it or whatever. But or the government told him, no, eh, we probably shouldn't be talking about that, because um, at that time he was probably still a CIA operative on some level. But um, and that is all true, you know. That came out that he worked for the CIA, and he did. Um, and and all that is true, but it's like intertwined in these crazy, you know, wacko theories that so you, and it gets to a point where everything's so quagmired that you can't even tell the difference anymore because it does sounds really good you know it could be it could be absolutely true but you never know and that's the problem like that that's what became the problem for 9-11 for me is that things got so quagmired that there were you couldn't even differentiate between the reality and the bullshit because it all sounded good. You know, it all sounded completely plausible. Except for the towers Except never were the there hologram. in the first place. That the hologram one. thing. Now, there was one video where somebody, like, showed how a wing kind of, like, went through a building, but the building didn't get destroyed or whatever. And no. I'm like, <laughs> and this, and this guy like, will, like, yeah. it. everybody went crazy about this video. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Well, how do we know he didn't CGI that? Like, we know. I mean, or <laughs> it, that's not what's happening on a video because that's not what happened in real life, and you're just interpreting a grainy video as something. Right, else. Versus the, the millions of people that were in New York hearing and seeing an airplane <laughs> crash into two buildings. Shadows. <laughs> There's a hundred thousand things that you have right. to disprove before you can even go there. Uh, right. I recently heard a kind of banal conspiracy theory, entirely plausible. I'm trying to remember, it was basically that um, I don't know involved the Mossad and the CIA, and basically the idea was that because the CIA was aware that Mossad, were, Mossad, Mossad was doing something in the U.S. And there was basically just a, a, refusal, a refusal to share information because, you know, people who weren't supposed to be domestically spying or people who were not supposed to be spying in the U.S. were doing yeah. stuff. And they kind of knew something was up and they didn't share it. I, I wish I remembered the details, but it well, seems, so, you know, so plausible was, in the real world. It's the story of the five Israeli kids that were arrested and released and... The Justice Department. Of I've heard that from a very uncredible source. Um, my boyfriend's brother-in-law, who believes everything, everything. Um, hmm. So. Well, maybe it wasn't true, but um, but but <laughs> but the thing is, the thing is, and the Snowden leaks um, really brought this to light. There was a well-known practice back in the day, not not so far back in the day, um, of countries sending people to other countries to spy on that country for that country so that that country could say, we're not spying on our people, because they would use other countries to spy on their people. Mm. Um, mm. So it was like a plausible deniability thing, and then they, you know, somehow they always had the information they needed. You know, right yeah, yeah. Um, the way that... Um, oh, God, what do you call it? If you send someone off to be tortured by another country, you're like, well, I didn't torture him. Um, a rendition? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. That kind of thing. All sorts of technicalities. It's all about language. I mean, the, these people are ruled by their lawyers, right? They know exactly how mm -hmm. to spin whatever it is that they need. I mean, look what happened the day of 9-11. It was Cheney's attorney who made sure that the president could do whatever it is he, you know, was within his rights to do or whatever. Um, yeah. I mean, it was all lawyers that made that happen, you know, and, and, and lawyers of, and everybody who looked at these documents that were like the new orders, the new marching orders said, 
I need my attorney to look at that before I say it's okay. I mean, like, this was high-level shit because everybody knew that they were basically wiping their ass with the Constitution. I mean, they knew that. And even the feds... That would be the subtitle of the Bush years, yeah. Right. And, um, <laughs> but I mean, the, the thing about, like, everything that happened after, not, like, from September 12th on was all about you know, publicly, putting a public face on all the things that they were already doing. That's what it was. That's why technology innovations, I don't even know the orders of magnitude that they, that they increased since, since that day in the public sector. I mean, I'm talking cell phones, I'm talking laptops, I'm talking tablets, all these things just like burst onto the scene after 9-11 because it was out, you know? They, you know, it's a well-known thing that all the technology we get is 15 or 30 years of, um, oh, sorry, hang on a minute. Sorry, 15 or 30 years beyond what the, um, what the government has already had. And we just get the hint. You think that's true? Absolutely, I've seen it, I've seen it. When, we were, when I was in Afghanistan in 2000, Maybe it was the second time. Second time I was in Afghanistan. We already had drones that could fly however high up in the air and narrow down on a on a gnat's, you know, ass hair. Like I mean I remember look walking into a top so and looking at a video feed of one of these drones and I thought it was a landing. Or I th actually, I thought it was crashing because of how quickly it was, you know, coming towards the ground. And it was just zooming in. I mean, we had technology that was mapping the area in a way that, you know, they were using things like, like Google Earth now, back then. Except live yeah. feed, obviously, not, you know, the three-year-old bullshit maps. That so how screwed are we, guys? How screwed are we? Oh. Um, I, 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 this is just such such bunker ready talk. Like, mm. how large should my arsenal be, and how many tinfoil hats should I make? <laughs> oh, I have I have exactly one hope for surviving the apocalypse, and that is uh, that? when the American system crashes crashes into horror and rioting, and like Mel Gibson is riding the streets. Uh, it's winter. And then you guys don't come up here until, like, until all, like, you don't come and get all my food. All our, like, little peaceful, disarmed so Canadians. All, like, winter protects us. That's all we've got. We're all moving in with Mike. Oh, I, yeah. No, no, yep. no to everyone, I'm in Winnipeg. Right there. there are no geographic barriers oh. to your advance. It's a flat plain. My only hope is a huge snowbank that prevents the wall of North Dakotans <laughs> from raiding my property. Oh God, the North Dakotans. Um, yeah, I'm right now. I'm somewhere in Pennsylvania where, like, a short-term doom situation, I would be great. Long-term, I don't know. <laughs> all the people that I would flee to are too far away. They're all Southerners, by the way. The people that I would hide with during the apocalypse. Well, we all we are all pretty seasoned here in New Orleans after what we went through in 2006. But I wasn't actually living here for that. But I did deploy down here with the army to try and pick up Weird. the pieces. And um, that, I will say, was the most uncomfortable experience as a soldier I ever had because I was actually deployed basically against my own citizens. Um, mm. They pretty sure intentionally deployed um, the local National Guard to Iraq Right. So that they could have a reason to bring people. And this is policy. I mean, you can look at training documents where they basically say, um, as a policy, never to deploy local National Guard or soldiers to an area because they won't have the ability to be impartial and following out orders. Right, right. You're really going to, like, send a bunch of guys with AK-47, or sorry, m to go patrol near their ex-girlfriend's houses, like like things are gonna go wrong if you start setting that up. Right, right, right. Now, now, 
I mean, we came here and we were given marching orders to disarm citizens. That was, and that's been disputed. There's people even now who I talk to about it who refuse to believe that that happened, but it happened. Why? I mean, it absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's totally. I'm totally willing to believe well, that. Here's, I mean, here's the thing, though. I would assume that was Afghanistan, true. That was our first. That was our first mission in Afghanistan, right? We we jumped into Kandahar. We secured the airport so that we could bring in supplies and set up. And then we went from village to village, and the first thing we did was disarmed everyone, everywhere we went, and left them one rifle to protect them from bandits or whatever, per village. And then I come back and get out and find this, you know, internment training document that basically illustrates every single thing that we were taught to do over there for people to eventually do here at some point, given the right circumstances. So, I mean, the training's... Given what circumstances? The, the right circumstances, did you say? What? Um, given what circumstances here? The right circumstances. They would do this? You know, um, you know mass insurrection. <laughs> you know, Ferguson times a thousand, basically. I mean, they did it. A libertarian elected president. Right. Oh, they got one. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no um that honestly we do have some hope though i mean most of these people in congress are like a hundred years old so i mean they have to die <laughs> right otherwise otherwise they're cheating and we've caught them right like they're obviously on some kind of illuminati miracle lizard. or some shit. they're lizards <laughs> david Ick was right <laughs> well, Jess, I hate to break it to you. Whenever one of them reaches an age that's too old for humans, they just shed their skin and they come back like 20 years later with a new skin. So, gotcha. Exactly. <laughs> and they're still statists because reptilians are just. Actually, reptilians are all statists except David Ick also. Met... He thinks that Chris Christopherson is also a reptilian, which I find to be the funniest part of the whole thing. Like all of these high ups, all the Rock, Rockefellers, Rothschilds, Bushes, and such. Oh, and, and also Chris Christopherson, he's also a reptilian. Clearly, he's why? The reptilian, right? he's, he would have to be the leader. That's why he's so off put, like off to the side, in some seemingly unrelated <laughs> position. Like what? Well, I guess well Beyonce is like an Illuminati priest. Oh right, I guess, the, uh, right? the uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 I recently learned from YouTube comments that the Illuminati killed Amy Winehouse, hmm. not alcoholism, drug use, or bulimia. No, it was the Illuminati. Oh, that's, really, that's what Occam's razor That is, that is one more beautiful thing they took from us. Be the cause. Um, I did you hear the thing about um, what's her face? Uh, Oprah or not Oprah Winfrey? Uh, Whitney Houston had um, was it Whitney Houston? Yeah. Um. She had like sarcophaguses at her viewing, like outside the door into where her viewing was. They had these like Egyptian sarcophaguses just like chilling outside. Does that mean that she too was an Illuminati priestess? I, who knows? Presumably. I don't, I don't <laughs> following these things. I used to. Now, from like just before like the December 21st thing. I got really wrapped up in um, GodlikeProductions.com, which is like, like. Oh God! I just looked at that. I was trying to figure out if if FEMA camps were real, where they would be in my area. I got arrested for trying to find that website. I got arrested trying to find one a few years ago. They're not real. They. I really. Well, it's unfortunately, none of the evidence for that is. Incredible. Unfortunately, I I, I, did, I've seen. I did find a a camp. It just happened to be a federal penitentiary, and uh, <laughs> evidently spoke too kindly to people waltzing two and a half miles onto a federal penitentiary property before their security catches. Whoops. So. Um, That's some good security on their part, I must say. Well, the bad part was I had just came from our um, uh, Adam Kokesh July Fourth rally. So I had like a mm. bag full of ammo and like three different rifles in my truck. Oh no! So 
they look. immediately so i'm not even kidding you they looked in my vehicle right i i i was straight up with them i told them look i know this is gonna look really <laughs> shitty but this is what's going on so they went in there and they called everybody right they called the park rangers fucking everybody <laughs> who had a gun in this itty bitty little east louis or uh, west side louisiana town showed up and um they were all talking sovereign citizen right sovereign citizen oh they got guns they're trying to these oh. these three fucking kids one of them who's a cop lock, known cop blocker who looks like he's fucking 15 and was shitting his pants like <laughs> i felt so bad for him i mean he's so good if he's behind his camera right he is hardcore you know, libertarian cop locker, but without that camera, he, uh, not so much. Um, not that I blame him. I mean, shit. Right. Um, but, um, yeah, no, so we were there for probably four hours and they were talking about how, like, they were going to put us in there and how, you know, people were outside playing soccer and they had to be taken back into their pen because we didn't, they didn't know what was going on and they thought we were going to ambush the facility or whatever and they thought maybe we had friends in the wood line just waiting for the right time to strike and... oh my Jeez. god <laughs> i'm pretty sure sovereign citizens is, is the biggest internal conspiracy theory on the planet to be honest with you i have scans somewhere i'll see i'll try and post them excuse me of um internal training documents that they give cops about like sovereign citizens First of all, I've never seen anybody get arrested that actually claimed to be a sovereign citizen. I've heard people being accused of being sovereign citizens, but they're always doing really right. stupid shit, like showing up at a at an MRE checkpoint after a storm with a fucking AR-15. Like, who the fuck does that? Like, what, what? Well, sometimes it's more... I remember writing in a Reason blog about supposed sovereign citizens, and I know cops are always terrified they're going to amb get ambushed by them at like a right. traffic stop. But you never. See but these dudes, there was something about their plates, and it ended up that they got cut out of their seatbelts because they refused to get out of the car, and they just like sat there and made the cops cut them out of their well, seatbelts, which I appreciate. Yeah. It's very Adam Kokesh, and it's like. I'm not going to comply, but I'm going to be a total pain in the ass, well, but I'm so not going to do anything. So, so in this training pamphlet, they had, like, license plates that were obviously fake. Like, you would – my three-year-old sons would look at that and know it was fake. You know, they had these driver's licenses that had, like um, – what is that fake nation? begins with an M. The Moors, right? The Moorish nation or whatever that – I don't know. Anyway, there was like blatantly fake IDs, blatantly fake what drivers uh, uh, license plates, and um, like you wouldn't be fooling anybody trying to trying to pull this off. But um, it just seems like it's a way for them. So now, if any of us says in a situation where we're being harassed by cops, you know, I have my sovereignty. I'm a sovereign citizen. You're done. You're fucking done. You're going under the FEMA camp. Like, because <laughs> every cop is now trained that if you say the word sovereign, you're a fucking terrorist. You might as well have been flying one of yeah. them. So, like, sovereign is now not a safe word for us. Yeah, that's true. And Sovereign individual. Nope, don't say oh. it. I've been using that as a safe word for years. Ew. <laughs> bad visual. Bad visual. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> um. On that note, no, I don't know. Um. But but the FEMA camps. That's a, that's a very 1990s paranoia, I think. Yeah. Like, they definitely talk about. <laughs> FEMA camps in the first X Files movie and stuff. Well, like it's very I mean, Web 1.0, bright yellow text on a black background type of well, thing. Well, but you had to, you have to appreciate, like, so in the 90s you had, supposedly you had all these big militia movements, right? And that's where you had, uh, right, Timothy McVeigh come out of. 
which he didn't actually. He came out of the military sh- straight up. They tried to. I know. They tried yeah. to show a bunch of pictures of him in uniform and play it off like he was in a militia, but he wasn't. And there's there's some interesting things around the Oklahoma City thing too that um that that make that a very interesting um, situation. A lot of things about Oklahoma City actually map onto uh, the 9/11 conspiracy theories. Probably you know the same way any good legend is born is you have elements of one story tie into elements of another story. You know. Um, like they they talked about how people in uniform were seen, uh, and some people said they saw Timothy McVeigh in the government building at Oklahoma City days before the explosion, and how they were um, they were putting some kind of painting some kind of putty like substance onto the walls in some of the places in the uh, in the Oklahoma City building, and. Uh, that was the problem with all of that is that eyewitnesses are shitty. Right. No, um, but I mean these were that's a problem that with a lot told. of conspiracy theories. But these were stories that were told. And then there was a story about how the ATF, which had a you know, a built an office in the building, were told to not show up that day. And um you know. And that happened. That was that apparently really happened. So I mean some things. So the the like handful of feds who did die, did they not like those guys? <laughs> Like, well, everybody except Jimmy, Steve, Irving, Fred, and Carl do not go to the Murrah building today. Uh, but fuck those guys. Shit. <laughs> we can't afford that. <laughs> Steve, uh, we just need you to pick, drop in and pick up some mail around 9.15. That'd be good. Oh, <laughs> uh, poor Steve. <laughs> But that was one of the, 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 no, but that was one of the good things. I used to listen to um, talk about the king of conspiracy theorists. I used to listen to Alex Jones a lot, and uh, I kind of love him, but not in the I believe things he says. Kind yeah, of way. I mean um, he's in a just like he's hot. Or what? He's just really funny. He's very charismatic. He's fascinating to me. He's, I mean, he's built a model that is. If emulated properly, would really be effective. I mean, if you really look at where he was, like around 9/11 or whatever, to what he has built, it's impressive. I mean, it's an impressive operation. And I mean, yeah. I mean, he's he's an alarmist. He is a. I mean, the the things he comes up with are. Interesting. Um, the the correlations he makes. I mean, some of it's pretty on point, or appears to be pretty on point. But um, you know, he really embellishes a lot of details, and he really makes a lot of. He does. There. I've I've found useful or interesting stories from Infowars. But it's like Wiki- it's like a, a terrified version of Wikipedia. Right. You have to go to the original source because you can't trust yeah. it. Yeah. It's like a long journey from like Drudge to Infowars. <laughs> Once I went from like Info like from Drudge to Infowars to World Net Daily, and World Net Daily isn't crazy and never links, so then I had to Google it. And there was actually a real useful news story. It was actually a cop thing in this case, I think. But it took me on this like epic journey through sources I could not right. trust. Well, so so that's the thing too about like I now only follow people who source all their stuff, who says, you know, they mm-hmm. talk about whatever, you know, Eric Garner thing, this new um, taser slash shooting thing, all these different things. He waits to talk about it, whereas Alex Jones like wants to get there as soon as possible right so it doesn't give a shit no cross-referencing i'm just going to throw this out there and we'll see what happens you know um and his redactions are always very discreet you know but um yeah like the major news um but like i follow people who wait see let the news kind of fetter out a little bit see get some of the details really look at what's all out there and then puts out pieces of information. And he doesn't say this is what happened. He says this is what appears to be happening or 
happened or whatever. And that I appreciate. And and he does a lot and of scientific swear... things. Like they do a lot of scientific stuff, and and they cite specific white papers and and years, like you know, decades worth of data. Um, that any and, and they you know people that always make sure you understand the difference between causal and correlation because it does Wait, who is who do you read that this actually careful i don't think i know of a writer on god's earth this <laughs> not one good actually i know i keep saying he but it's not it's not any one person in particular but, but like in general, he's talking about lucy <laughs> I, Come on. I'm talking about I mean, that I don't know anybody that's on there, but. <laughs> um, in general, I hate that usually we have to choose between the like mainstream media and the alternative media, like to use general generalizing, mm -hmm. where like you have people like Alex Jones, uh, just a lot of websites where you, you know it's not the New York Times or anything close to it, so you don't quite trust who's writing it. A lot of these people, like Alex Jones, have all the, the right attitude. Oh my God, power! I have to go fight against power and tell the truth and stuff. But they can't be trusted. It's like you, whereas the mainstream media knows how to, you know, be trustworthy, present the sources, do their journalism ethics. They just don't cover to. lots of things. They used to. Well, oh, I mean, whoa, Lucy. What, what do you mean, the, the sources? What are you talking I, I'm thinking like back to 2003, the run up to the Iraq War. Nobody did their the homework. About them, no, no, you're right. You're right. They were looking, so there was a lot of ratings. Scoop, like, uh, what do they call that, Lucy, when they, you're just going after the ratings? Um, Being a bad person? I don't know. Capitalism? No, there's, there's specific. <laughs> industry term for it. I can't remember. Um, anyway, there's, um, you know, there was a lot of sensationalist things that were going on. And, um, and there wasn't any time. There wasn't, there, things were happening so quickly, you know, and the government was just saying things and it was like, you know, these are the people that are leading us through one war, allegedly successfully. And, and, you know, it's so secretive well, that okay. we have no choice but to listen to them because we have no idea what's going on. And that is the that is the media's horrible flaw. I wrote my um my my communications. <laughs> yes, I'm good at economics and selling <laughs> a communication major. Um, I wrote my thesis about like Waco and Ruby Ridge and the media. Most of it was kind of about Waco. And I basically just tried to look up how it was covered at the time. So that was, that was, and it was really, first thing to know that. really shameful because what they did was they just decided that whatever the feds were telling them was true. Right. No, absolutely. And not, not only did they ignore the fact that the feds obviously had a huge bias, but they ignored the fact that there were two parties that, you know, in the situation, there was the feds and there was the Davidians. And if both sides have a bias, but the thing is, one side literally barring your access to the other side. So not only did they fail to admit the feds have a bias, they failed to just really think about this side is literally preventing us from seeing the other side of the story. It's like they, 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 they refuse to say, we don't know what's happening. All we know is the Fed said X, Y, Z, but since we can't see it for ourselves, all we can say is the Fed said this because we don't Maybe know. It's, it's like they won't say that. They just believe they, they take the Feds as this voice of God, and it's just just unforgivable. Well, good. Now that you're finally getting it, here's your here's your blue pill. Let's get back to work. <laughs> um, what, 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 what I this is the show when media, Lucy Stegerwald though. finally gets it. <laughs> what, I, what, what I meant with the media, though, is not that they are good but that often what they do is they report a couple of stories that they happen to cover decently well mm -hmm. you know they have sources they can kind of prove what they're saying and there's a million other important stories that they just never report because they don't want to dig for it they don't want to question government institutions and actually say why does this exist they don't get up one day and say like why the fuck does the dea exist 
or why is all this money being spent on this? Yeah. They just don't talk about it. Yeah. And that way they can stay credible because what they do talk about often they, they do an, a decent enough job if they bother to cover it. But then and the alt media is full of liars and conspiracy theorists. So there's really no there's no media that can be trusted. <laughs> That's what it comes down right. to, I think. And and again, you know, you have news media uh, moguls now that are being shot at, right, by unknown assailants, and then shortly retiring thereafter. So I mean, there's your state uh, of I think I creeping up again. Um, but what you see now, or at least what I've been seeing now, like the Boston bombing is a perfect example. You didn't mm -hmm. see anybody there. They all were at the White House press room or the Boston Municipal Building or whatever, being told what happened. Well, and being told not only local being, news yeah, was there, but being told what not to listen to. Right? Because but I saw clips later that showed that local news was at least getting a little closer. Cable news, all they were doing was standing on a street corner a mile away from the action right. being like, gee, what's happening in this thing we can't see right now? Look at us in the field. We're not even in the studio. We're actually on the streets. Yeah. Like it was, it was embarrassing. But there is some footage that implies local news, which I didn't see obviously because I'm not in Boston, that they got a little bit from it. But I do remember watching, being like, they're they're these cable news people. They're not doing anything. They're just standing here, far away from everything. Well, local news is a lot better. And the bad thing is about, or not not bad for us, but bad for the establishment, is that the internet has brought local news stations onto an international platform. So now yeah. we have an ability, especially with Facebook and things like that, and this is where the cop thing is really, you know, getting kicked in the ass, is that a lot of these cop stories aren't internet aren't national stories. But because the cop problem is a national issue, any local thing that happens is getting sensationalized. Well, I don't want to say sensationalized because that has a bad connotation, but it's being brought into the limelight much more quickly than. And well, now it is. Yeah. So, now that but, we can finally admit that the problem with police started last August and no one was reporting anything about it before. Right. And not Radley Balco or Reason Magazine or me. Nope. The problem started in August, everybody. Right. But. But what we but what we have now is the ability to not have to wait for the problem to, to fester and, and become some humongous, unbearable monster. We can now nip uh, if we if we conduct ourselves properly, we can nip these issues in the butt before it manifests itself that big because we have quicker visibility into it. We can map, you know, we can map all these different admittedly unrelated things and demonstrate a much bigger problem because it's not like the Atlanta Police Department and the Ferguson Police Department are conspiring with one another to have shitty cops. It's right. just a shitty culture. Right. It's a culture problem. It's a fraternity problem. It's a union problem. You know, the, the Garner thing. And the Fed, I mean, the feds make these things worse with money and strings and okay, yeah. so, and so you have like so there is that common element. so you have the race pimps and the yeah. and the you know the the people that show up that are state actors that are paid to aggravate and you have unions like specifically in the eric garner thing and i just read this this morning um that even though the the hospital the coroner's office said that it was homicide or it was that the death was caused by, you know, the choking and all that. It was the union who said, yeah, no, that's not true. And that's what was taken, this benevolent police union or whatever it was called. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they're the worst. The, the bad part for them is these these really minute details are now coming into light. So now with that that piece right there in particular, we can now see where the real power brokers are in terms of the police culture. The police, and this goes for businesses and, you know, a lot of other things. This, this, can, be, this can be, you know, mapped out all over the place. But these unions 
are money magnets and they and they and they throw money into the politics they throw money into the you know whatever they need to to have that power so when it matters they can stand up and say my guys are, are not at fault here you know and and he got off the hook not because of the cops but because of the union so well i mean the union of, of right but if you they might as well be is, is that you have this culture of police that know that they have the backing of the fraternity and of the union to protect them. I know. So it's like the, it's like big pharma, <laughs> you know. I was just talking to my my coworkers the other day about how, you know, there was an act passed I think in '71 or whatever that absolves the pharmaceutical manufacturers from all responsibility of any fatal side effects that happen from the drugs and the vaccines that they produce. That's not a that's not a conspiracy theory. That shit is real. They are not liable yeah. for anything that happens. Why not? Well, how do you, how do we get class action lawsuits then? They don't. They they sue the doctors, or they sue, or the the government actually has. I found this out when I had my kids. The government actually has a fund that pays for any fatal side effects from vaccinations. And. Uh, if you think about it, how long does it, how many people have to die before the government actually creates a fund for something? I don't know. But I don't know. I have no words on that because it's just. I mean, I'm not an anti vaxxer per moment. se, but I mean. <laughs> He's just asking yeah. questions. That's all I ever do. Just ask questions. I don't want to call myself an investigator because um, I might get shot, but. Anyway, you know, I feel like I, in some ways I should make a conspiracy theorist podcast and like each podcast should be devoted to some, some like other various conspiracy. Ooh. Yeah, this is an idea that I'm going to, I'm going to mull over. Um, it's because so there's a lot to talk about. And with libertarians, there's this wonderfully horrifying overlap between like that's total bullshit that actually happened and it's historical fact and then there's like that's conceivable we have no idea we don't have the proof but it's humanly possible and since i just trust the government i'm gonna get creeped out when i think about it let me let me speak to something that the not satanists just talked about the food pyramid thing so true story about the food pyramid the food pyramid was something that came out of um lbj and as I understand it, what happened was um, LBJ, when he ran for president, was running around looking for support from the dairy farmers. Because he's a you know an old country boy, and um, they wouldn't give it to him. So he moved on to the uh, the wheat and grain people, and they gave him support. And supposedly, as a result of that. This whole food pyramid thing came about that really kind of built up the grains and uh, wheat thing, and um, not so much on the meats and dairy. So, from what I hear, that's that's where the uh, fairly credible. <laughs> that I do believe. Um, and LBJ was oh God, a that... crony ass politician too, like. If something crazy did happen with JFK, I would look at him. Um, I'm gonna see if I can if I can cite this. So Lucy, say something clever. <laughs> uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Am I still the host? Good to know. Oh, I didn't mean that. That's, you're very kind to uh, let me let me do that. What are you even looking up? We should we should have ended this like four minutes and eighteen seconds ago. Um, <laughs> Ask Mike if I hate anything LB more about about how we conduct ourselves. It's uh oh my god, shut up, Ed. It's uh structured structured sessions on here. Should I leave you two alone with this podcast? I'm you and a Satanist, <laughs> Jeff.
Jesse can just have a uh, good old time. We're just ew, Satanist. That's cool. <laughs> Why would you say that? He's he's oversharing right now. Okay. What are you looking up, Jesse? Because I'm gonna end this otherwise. LBJ. What's happening? What about LBJ? The LBJ. Okay, here. LBJ wanted the support of the egg and dairy farming industry. Being from Texas, he felt it would look very bad if he did not get the support of the significantly large portion of the farming industry. But the egg and dairy farmers, for various reasons, balked. They would not throw their support behind LBJ. Johnson was furious, so he courted and won the support of the grain farmers. But that was not all. After the election, he wanted revenge on the egg and dairy farmers, and he wanted to reward the grain farmers for supporting it. This is where things get downright spooky, blah, 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 blah. Johnson decided that he and his administration would issue a new concept, a food pyramid, that would help children and their parents make good food choices, not to mention those who are older and suffering from various maladies. I'll link to it. Yeah. That's, um, that's the kind of uh, bullshit, self-interested, slash arrogant thing that they do they do that and they get away with that all the time that's true um, um but at the, at the end of the day the just the government thank god is not as competent as not as flawless as most conspiracy theories suggest <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, it's not like at the end of 1984 when the implication is that the party is going to get you what no matter what because they have this sort of right. control. Yeah. But then on the other hand, that may not really be literally true. It just may be part of the breaking new process to make you believe that whatever you do, though, they will get oh. you. That just occurred to me. So now I'm using on that. Yeah. But it's not like that. It's actually... It's harder to control people. Like I, conspiracy theories have this weird conflict with libertarianism. This is worthy of another like six hours of conversation, which is that. But which is like we say you can't do top-down control because the knowledge problem and and such and spontaneous order is gonna t you know win the day. So that's one reason why Bilderberg or the Illuminati. Um, are not running things. They just t people do similar things when they're in power. Well, and they that's, tend to be similarly. And hated. that's one thing that I I always felt very uh, drawn to was the fact that I don't know that there's like any conscious conspiracies going on. I just think this is a natural inclination for people in power to uh, to desire this kind of you know. They think they know better. Yeah. They think that they yeah. can make the world better. Um, I just want to do the Captain Mal at the end of Serenity quote. Like, they think they can make people better, and I do not hold to that. Um, Satanist <laughs> is, is being all dark right now and saying that the powers at, uh, at B do top-down control. They just make you think you're free. And I'm telling him I know that I'm not free. But they don't have perfect control because if they did, their shitty policies might actually work. Well, their nation building the, and their arrogant bullshit social engineering, it would work. It doesn't because people aren't robots and that's what they refuse to understand. Well, that's when you get. Like, Speak for yourself, Speaker Wall. That's when you get people like ah. Ray Carter's well that wants to turn everybody into a robot anyway. So. Um, they do want people to be robots. They want people to. They want to pass a law, and they want everything to follow just as they hoped, well, because they think that that's how it should work. The, the thing that gets me, and it frustrates me more than anything about the human race, is that freedom, for the most part, is just something that we made up. It was a word that was designed to speak about something that we already are and that we already have. It's not something that is given to us by anybody else. It's not something that can be taken from anybody else. It's just the level at which we're willing to give it up to stay alive or to keep watching TV or to stay comfortable. And yeah. 
you know, what really frustrates me in watching all these international um, protests, like in Egypt and in South America and all this, is that there's a million people. There's 200 cops. And they all, all the people that are protesting, stop at the fucking police line. Why? If you're tired of your fucking government that much to where a million people, the high, the whole city, is rallying against them, take them the fuck out. Be done with it. If you're there, it's finish. always a bloodbath. Finish. Revolutions are always a bloodbath. Did we learn I'm nothing not from the end of the Hunger Games? I'm not advocating for it, Lucy. I'm not. I'm not advocating for for that kind of a revolution at all. But if you're already there, where a million people are in the streets, they're already being violent amongst themselves. Why stop at the police line and let them spray fucking chemicals at a water cannons at you and beat you and arrest you and and punish you even more once because people forget or the next season of Who Wants to Blow a Billionaire comes on or whatever. Like... I mean, there's like a tipping point that has to happen, and it rarely happens. Right. It happens. I mean, I don't know. Like the Berlin Wall, it kind of it it kind of happens when the Berlin Wall fell, but that was based on you know a like a mess up from a politician on TV, and a bunch of people right. thought misunderstood, and they came to the wall, and they thought they'd be allowed in, and the guards could have shot at them which might have stifled the whole storming the wall, fuck you, East Germany thing. But they didn't, maybe because there were too many of them, or maybe because they were like, I don't feel like massacring people today, even if I am a Berlin Wall border guard. Right. It, it always seems like there's just, it's like this type of tipping point that you can't ever force, no matter how much you want it to happen, for people finally to be like, Are we, aren't we sick of this shit yet? I was watching, it's like it can't be forced. It just has to happen or it doesn't, and it usually doesn't. Right. I was watching a voice and exit video um, earlier about North Korea, and the guy was talking about how bad North Korea is, and, and specifically, you know, very, very specific detail. Um, and I got to thinking about, like, we're really not that far. I mean, we have nicer things. And we're allowed more liberty, but it's it's at gunpoint a great deal, you know. I mean, we just had tax day yesterday. Um, yes, we did. I mean, every we could have all ranted about that. Huh? We could have all we could have spent the whole hour ranting about tax day. I forgot all about that. I'm trying to block it out. Yeah, I know. I actually I called them like a moron yesterday, forgetting it was tax day, because I was trying to figure out why I I couldn't get my uh, employer ID number for one of my various ventures, and um, they they straight up said in the <laughs> they had a voicemail come on or like a, a auto attendant come on and be like, we're not taking calls for that specific issue right now. Try later. I was like, oh, well, thank you for saving me the time. Anyway. At least they were honest. I did my tests yesterday. Yeah. Um, I got there's a special headache that I swear only happens on tax day. It's the taxes headache. Yeah. I should have. Then I had various people. I should have waited till after tax day to quit drinking. Mmm. Indeed. <laughs> oh, um. What are you drinking? Any, cider, hard cider. Um, yeah, the end of a hard cider. No more. Best bar. I gotta go eat my midnight dinner. Wait, when did we start the... Oh, time zone. 9.30. What? Yeah, wow, it's late. Anyway, um, so this was, in theory, urban and bitches. In practice, it was Mike and Jesse and I trying to talk about the elections and then going down a wondrous rabbit hole of paranoia, uh, doom and naysaying. I think we might and so, a little bit. Yeah, well, that's true, too. Um, so 
So yeah, I hope that you uh, hearty three people in the audience, especially you Satanist, I mean Satanist, you're all right. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope any YouTube or Liberty.me audience in the future enjoys this. I'm not even prepared to uh, promote any other podcasts. Just, I'm sure something good's coming up. I don't know. Um, we'll see. Thanks, Mike. Well, Mike, Mike do you have and thanks, do you have anything, Jesse. Anything announcements? Uh, yeah, I don't have a link for it yet, but uh, Jeffrey's. Oh, well. Um, uh, speaking of uh, the horrors of the total state to which we are all certainly doomed. Um, on Sunday night, Jeffrey's covering uh, Eugene Richter's Pictures of a Socialistic Future, which is a dystopian science fiction novel, which is great, but but not often read. And it's one of his 25 life-changing classics. So that's on Sunday night at 8 Eastern. It's going to be a great one. Uh, that's intriguing. Uh, people should turn in, tune into that. Um, anything yeah, else, absolutely. people? Anything? Going oh, once, geez. twice, promote yourselves. Is Tiffany still with the man? Which man? The the, the, the man who's probably in jail for drunk driving now? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, po possibly. <laughs> uh, yeah, go yeah. look at my work if you want to. Follow me on Twitter, because that's where my work usually is. L-U-C-Y-S-T-A-G. Um, I'm behind on lots of writing, but go read my Vice thing about stingrays, I guess, audience people. Yeah, absolutely. That's really spooky. I read that whole thing, and at the end of it, like, Lucy linked it. I read the whole thing, and at the end of it, I was like, this is crazy. i got to tell Lucy about this. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, God, she has to know. Um, it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. Google it, Satanist. we got to wrap this thing up. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, thanks. No, Mike. I got it. I got the link for Satanist. I'm going to read it right now. Okay, good. Um, all right. Let me end this, you monsters. <laughs> good night, y'all. Thanks, uh, Mike and Jesse and Satanist and all you fine audience. Um, hopefully, there will be more bourbon and bitches with more bitches next time. Um, and more bourbon, <laughs> presumably. See ya. Bye, guys.